that is taught in the word, communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Yes. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Amen. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Let us pray. Father, again, we thank you for the privilege, the opportunity to break the bread of life and to feed those that are here. God, we ask for your divine intervention that you will arrest our hearts, our minds, our thoughts. And Father, let this message just prowl through the hearts of every individual. Let it take seed and take place and accomplish that which it is purposed to do. God, we ask for your blessing and favor and we'll give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name, we said amen, amen and amen. Now, there's 66 books in the Bible. There's hundreds of thousands of messages that you can preach. As pastors, we understand and know that there's certain messages that we like to preach again and again and again and again. They're easy. They're anointed. They're powerful. Yeah. But every part of the Word of God is powerful. And, and I had this message. The Lord laid it on my heart way back weeks ago. And... And I was wallowing with my own self, thinking I'd like to preach something a little different. You ever do that? You get a you get a different option. You think I'd like to do this. And we was traveling down the road yesterday, and the wife turned on the phone or the radio, one of the two. I don't remember which one, but there was a preacher come on. And he was talking about the same thing that I'll be preaching to you today. And I looked over at her and I said, I guess that's confirmation enough, isn't it? So, so we want to try to follow the Lord instead of ourselves. But today I'd like to title this message that your harvest is greater than your seed. Yeah. Uh, your harvest is greater than your seed. Now, uh, we're, we kind of live in the country and, and you guys are in the country a little bit. I, I've never been much of a gardener. Uh, Jen's a better gardener than I am and I can I can run a plow and I can throw seed in the ground and I can go out and pluck it when it gets done but all that process in between I'm not the best at uh, but I want you to know today that there is a law of seed time yeah. and harvest how many of us know that yeah. uh, it's not necessarily karma but I understand that theory with that and I'm not here to preach about that uh, I'm also not here to talk about getting revenge and, and an eye for an eye. That's not the message today either. But the message today is that your harvest is always greater right. than oh. your seed. Yes. Now, can I say it this way? Good, bad, or indifferent, your harvest will always be greater than the seed that you put out there. Yeah. Now, as we look into this and when we talk about seed time and harvest, a lot of people like to get on the financial side of it, and there's nothing wrong with that. Certainly it does apply that you cannot outgive God. And the more you give to God, the more you give to the kingdom, the more you sow in to prophets and to ministers and churches and teachers and buying Bibles and supporting evangelists, then all those blessings that they have, you're going to get an overflow into those, whether it be spiritual, physical, or financial, or ever how that it may be. We know that you cannot outgive of God. Amen. And pastors, and I'm not necessarily suggesting this, but you guys have a wonderful building. You have great people and, and all that. But there was a pastor challenged his church one time. He said, if you don't believe in tithing, if you feel like you can't afford it, he said, write it down. Give every month your full 10% tithing into the church for three months. And he said, if you come to me in three months and you pull out your books and you prove to me that you're in worse shape now than you were three months ago, he said, the church will refund all of your tithing in one lump sum check. Come on, come on. And he dared his church to do that. And do you know that there was not a single person Amen. in his church that came to him and said, I'm worse shape than it was before. You see, God has this power to, to uh, just double and to triple. Yeah. And the Bible is full of 20 and 40 and 60 and 100 fold that God will give back to us. Now, here today we want to talk about, again, that your harvest is always greater than your seed. Now, whatever you sow, you will reap. Yeah. Now, we're, we're talking about flesh and 
and the Spirit. Amen. Now, if you walk in the flesh, the Bible declares to you and I that you will fulfill the lust of the flesh. Yeah. You'll be fighting and bickering, and there'll be adultery and fornication and lying and, and thievery and whatever else that will go along with the flesh. The flesh is carnal. The flesh is mean. The carnal flesh is against the Spirit of God. And if we Come sow on. into those things, if we do those things, then that type of seed or harvest, that type of life, that type of framework of what we deal with will come back into our lives. Oh, what you do out there will affect wherever you go on, as man. long as you live. Man. Well, what if God forgives me? He will. He will forgive you, but there is a fallout, there is a harvest that will follow you till the day that you die yeah, and somebody on. plants you in the ground or a mausoleum or, or whatever the case may be. We have to realize every day that we live, we are sowing seed for our future. We are sowing seed for the benefit or for the destruction of, of our own lives. Yeah, now if we'll sow into the spirit, we'll reap spiritual things. How many of you know that? Yeah, we'll yeah. reap love and joy and peace and gentleness and long suffering and meekness and all the things that are part of the fruit of the Spirit. If we'll give those things away, the Bible says that God would cause men to give into our bosoms. He said that if we would tie the Word of God around our neck and bind it in our or bind it around our neck and hide it in our heart, he said that He would cause us to have favor with man. Yeah, and Lord. that we would also obtain favor with God. Yeah. I'm glad to know that God loves us uh, and he said if you'll do this I'll do great things for you Man. but he also told us if you do these bad things then you're sowing a seed that you're going to reap a harvest one preacher said it like this that we all like to sow bad seed uh, and then pray for a crop failure yeah. <laughs> Amen. Well, I wish it was that easy don't you <laughs> but probably if we're sowing bad seed our prayer for crop failure probably yeah. wouldn't yeah. go past the ceiling how many of you can say Amen, Amen to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. You can't go both ways. You have to follow God or you have to follow the Spirit. Now, I don't know if you ever noticed this or not, but how many of you remember Eve in the Bible? Yeah. Adam and Eve. Well, what did she do? We blame her for the first fall of mankind and she uh, brought it to her husband. You know the story, but the Bible says that, that Eve looked at the fruit of, or the tree that God had forbidden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and God said, if you take of this, then you'll surely die. You know the story. And the Bible says that she looked at it, and it was pleasant to the eye, and she decided that it would be good for the flesh, and that it would also bring her satisfaction. Now, the New Testament tells us that there's three things that will trip up a man or woman or the humanity and that is the pride of life, the lust of the eye, and the lust of the flesh. It got a hold of Eve in the very garden of Eden. And she began to look. She saw. She understood it was pleasant for her. She began to think on it. It was desiring of her flesh to want that. And then if she partook of that, the serpent had told her that you'll become something great. You'll be as God. Yeah. And that's the pride of life. I don't need anybody. I can handle this on my own. If you think that you can handle this life on your own, you are deceived as he was deceived. Yeah, on, and you will sow a seed that you don't want the harvest of. Now as we look into this, it's whatever you sow up you will reap. If you sow into the flesh, if you sow meanness, if you sow lying, if you sow deceitfulness, then you're going to be lied to. Somebody's going to be mean to you and somebody's going to deceive you. Yeah, amen. amen. We like to use the phrase, it's hard to con a con. But there's a con that can con the con. Yeah, right. <laughs> How many of you know? If you sow that out there, it'll come back to you. Yeah. If you sow the goodness of God, it will come back to you. Now, we live, we live in a microwave generation, I like to call it. And what does that mean? We like to hit a button and have instant coffee, instant dinners, instant heat ups. We like to have it right here, right now. And that's the issue with a lot of the church world. We'll be good 
for a week or two weeks or maybe a month and, and we'll expect a lifetime of harvest of, of good things and we're thinking why ain't this working I've been good for a day or two how many of you know that yeah. I've even done that too but we have to understand that what we sow today uh, we don't reap today what we sow today we reap in the future. Right. That's what I'm talking about. We sow into our future. There's an old cliche in the insurance industry. You'll appreciate this. It says that people don't fail to plan. Or, or they, let me back up. They don't plan to fail. People don't plan to fail. They just fail to plan. Right. Now, I used to work in the insurance business as well, and I know what it what it's like, and, and all the insurance premiums that, that, that I'd collected and all the uh, policies that I'd written, and everybody said, I'm insurance poor. I got way too much insurance, paying too much premium, but every time I paid a claim, there wasn't one of them handed me the check back and said, I've got too much insurance, Brother Larry. I'll take this back to the company. When we lay the claim up, we've never got enough. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Amen. It's yeah. the seed time up and the harvest coming back. What you put in, up, you'll get out. Yeah. We even used to say that in the church service. Up. Well, you'll get out of it yeah. what you put in it. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Now you can come and hype it. You can make the theatrics. You can do all that you know to do to make the service work. But if you ain't sowed the seed uh, no. to reap the harvest uh, yeah. for the glory of God to come, uh, it's all you've got is a bunch of theatrics uh, and a bunch of motion and commotion. Man, yeah. But if you pray and seek the face of God for His Spirit, uh, then when you walk in, uh, you'll see the glory of the Lord. Yeah. Now, how do we sow? It, it depends on how we sow. Some of us give very sparingly in life um, to others. Some give very generously to others um, in life. The Bible teaches you and I um, that we are the servants of God, um, that we are to serve one another, wow. that we are to prefer our brethren before ourselves. Wow, yes. Now, this is some tight preaching when you prefer your brother over yourself. Yeah. But Pastor Mark and I are both thirsty and we've got one bottle of water and he don't want to drink after me and I don't want to drink after him. One of us got to give. <laughs> it ain't the fastest to get to it. It ain't the biggest dog in the fight. But it's the heart that says Brother, I prefer you to have it to, yeah. at this moment instead of yeah. me. You hear what I'm telling you? It's the seed time and the harvest. Of, but our flesh says uh, we've got one bottle of water and the fastest cat to that is the one that gets it. Right. And if we're in the flesh, we're probably going to collide, yeah. bust the bottle between us, yeah. and we'll both do without. Yes, right. oh. That's the way the spirit of the flesh works. It reaps destruction everywhere that it goes. Now our lives may be wonderful. Today our lives may be in turmoil. Some of you may be sad, may be glad, may be mad. Yeah. <laughs> when you get a crowd of people, it's not a prophetic word, it's common sense. You get enough folks around them, there's somebody always sick. There's somebody happy, somebody mad, on, somebody in a in a strait, somebody's in a family uh, uh, upheaval. We understand that, so I'm not trying to be prophetic in that. Uh, and everything that you and I deal with uh, is not necessarily the harvest that we've sown, uh, but it is a repercussion of, of something that somebody else has sown uh, that we become part of the outfall. Yeah. Yeah. You see, your sin or my sin uh, don't just stay in my heart. It don't just affect my household, uh, but it affects everything and everywhere and everybody that I go and touch. Yeah. Sin, you, 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 I know you know that. Yeah. See, Adam and Eve sinned. It didn't stay in the Garden of Eden, no. but it went right to their direct posterity and one of their sons killed the other. Yeah. yeah. Sin will progress and continue to get worse and worse. But the Spirit of God will, can I say it? The Spirit of God will progress in your life. Yes. 
We like to say, well, I'm just human and we crutch up on all of the excuses of our failure. But the Bible tells you and I that if we walk in the Spirit, uh, somebody say yeah. with me, we will not, we will uh, say not. Will, not will not, fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, you can argue with me all you want. You can argue with Pastor Mark and Brother Larry. Uh, you can argue till your face turns blue. Uh, but you cannot deny what the Word of God said. Uh, it said if we walk in the Spirit, yeah. we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now what does that mean? Well, Brother Larry, I'm a good person. I don't run out here and sin and chase after women or men or this or that or the other. I understand that you may not. But are we liars? Are we deceivers? Are we hypocritical? Are we judgmental? Are we tail packers? Are we dividers? Are we running around busy bodying in people's business that we ain't got no business in? Are we saying, did you hear what Brother Mark said about you the other day? Man, I admire teamwork. Yeah. I admire teamwork. It's wonderful. Oftentimes, good church people have good intentions and bad actions. Yeah. Brother Mark, I'm really liking the way you're preaching anymore. You're doing a really good job. <laughs> I believe Brother Larry is slipping a little bit. He ain't where he used to be. I think I think I want to see and hear you preach more. Come on. Yeah, and there'll be somebody on that side say that, and somebody over here. Now, Brother Larry, you're gonna have to do something with that mark. He's he's getting bad out of hand. He's he's getting exalted in himself. And how many of you know people out there will try to divide these two right here? And God has put them together. This ain't a marriage, but what God has put together. Let no man put us under. Yeah. Don't cause division in your church. If you've got a problem with the pastors, uh, most likely it's you that's got the problem. Yeah. Is that okay to say that? Yeah, I've had people to try to tell me how to run the church and what to preach and when to preach. And I just looked at them and I said, well, if you know so much about it, I wonder why God didn't call you. <laughs> Maybe because they can't do nothing with them. You've got to be led by the Spirit. So are we sowing sparingly or are we sowing generously? Whatever that you have in your life, if it's not meeting your need, then maybe it's the seed that you need to sow. Yeah. You hear what I'm saying? If you don't have enough love coming into your life, into your house, into your church, into your job, if you don't have enough unity, if you don't have enough peace, if you don't have enough joy, then why not try to distribute yeah. some of that uh, and get it back yeah. out there? Uh, me and Jim was talking the other day that people all the time holler, I like to have revival. How many of you know that? Yeah. I'm not talking about 15 days of service. I'm talking about a revival, like a Holy Ghost anointing revival that you walk in, the power of God falls, uh, men and women fall out of all your prayer, uh, the sick get healed, uh, the lost get saved, uh, oh. and the glory of God uh, fills this house. Uh, yeah. How many of you would really like to have that? Yeah. Oh. Well, pastors, if you'd start revival, the Sister Jen said, draw a circle around yourself, go look in the mirror, and that's where revival starts. Yeah. If you don't have it in your heart, they can have revival till they tear up the carpet and empty the oil bottles and shake out the windows and knock the paneling loose when they're going around the curve. Yeah. And it won't do you a bit of good. Right. You'll sit there and think, wow, boy, they're getting in good. Yeah. I've been one of those dry folks. Sit right there and let them shout the house down, buddy. Just dancing and carrying on, speaking in tongues, slinging all and bobby pins and hair and ties and whatever else. And I'm sitting there thinking, when's this ever going to get done? Yeah. Well, Come on. Only time prayer lines exciting is when you're in it. Hello. I've been there too. Lord, I need prayer. Why well, ain't nobody praying for me? Yeah. When they needed prayer, where was you at? Uh-oh. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Every time we go to church, they're right up there. Yeah. Well, you know what? If you'd get up there with them, you might have the prayer of faith to get them through it, and then they'll quit getting in the church. We've got to sow into this thing. It's not about us. Yeah. See, when you walk into the kingdom, you die. Come on. Yeah. Who 
you are is no longer important. Right. What you want no longer matters. What you desire has nothing to do with anything other than your desire should be focused toward God. We become His. Yes. We become possessed with the Spirit. So we begin to sow seed that will bring us what we need. Amen. Yes, amen. You see, we have to understand this law of harvest is always greater than what we sow. Yeah. Now, you guys, again, you're farmers and gardeners, and you know about flowers and corn and watermelons that... You know, if you want corn, then you don't sow watermelon. Amen. We know that. But you can take two little grains of corn, you can throw them down in the ground, and they'll grow up some stalks, and they'll have multiple ears of corn on them with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of little kernels of corn that that one, two little seed will produce probably enough of, to sow an entire garden of corn the next time. That's right. Amen. So what are you saying, Brother Larry? If you're lacking in something, sow generously into it. Yeah. Don't just sow two seed, but get everything you've got and dump it into the kingdom of God. Get every effort that you have, every ability that you have, and give it to God. Yeah. The yeah. only way to get more in God is to give what you have away. Come on. That's, right. That's why we have to give our lives to God. Who was it? The Apostle Paul said, the life that I live is not my own, but it's Christ who lives inside of me yes. what we need doesn't matter anymore it's about christ the harvest is truly limited to our planting if we don't plant it we don't harvest it That's you right. know that you've got enough sense to know that if i don't plant a garden i can't go out to the backyard and get anything out of it Amen. there's nothing there and we often wonder sometimes when we come to church why is it God helping me. Why isn't anything any better? Why is my life not improving when I've started going to church? Yeah. Well, what are we sowing? The devil goes to church and his life ain't no better. Right. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah, he'll come right with you. He'll sit in your pew right beside of you. He'll get in your head. Tell you, you don't like this preacher. You didn't like that song. You don't like this. and You don't like that. And look over there at that one. And what's that one up there? And he'll distract your mind and you'll miss the whole service. We've got to sow into this that our harvest is limited to our planting. We have to understand that whatever we sow, we're going to reap the harvest. Sometimes people have even said this to me about sin. How many of you know what sin is? Anybody dare to tell the truth and say I've sinned? All righty. The Bible said we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But it also teaches us that we don't live nor remain nor continue in sin. Because the Spirit of God says that it no longer has power over us. People say, well, I just can't help it. You can too. If you get saved and born again, you can't help it. And if you can't help it, then there's not been a change. So you need to go back and do your first work and repent of your sin and God will forgive you. He'll give you a new heart and a new mind and He will work on you and change you. But everything don't happen overnight. But I've had people to say to me about sin, well... I thought it might be sin, but I didn't feel real bad about it. Mm -hmm. And if I felt bad about it, then I'd quit it. But since I don't, then it must not be sin. Uh -huh. That's one of the most foolish lies that the devil will tell you because he is a deceiver and he will intentionally not uh, bother you sometimes uh, and, and, and make you feel guilty over things uh, because the devil is the accuser of the brethren. You understand that? Yeah. But we have to understand that when the Spirit tries to convict us, uh, we have the choice to accept it or to reject it. And if we reject that conviction, the Bible teaches us that in time uh, that it will sear our conscience uh, as with a hot iron uh, and we can do open, bladed, categorized sin and not have a bad feeling about it. Right. So just because you don't feel bad about it 
doesn't mean that it's not sin. Man. Just because you don't feel guilty today doesn't mean that there's not a judgment that's coming down your road. That's right. You have to understand that what the Word of God said is sin is sin. Yes. It doesn't matter who approves it. It doesn't matter who feels good about it. It doesn't matter how long you've done it and not reap the harvest from it. Well, Some folks yes. have even said, well, I ain't getting nothing bad back. It must not be bad. You just hang around long enough. <laughs> It'll come. Yeah. Some harvest takes longer than others. Yeah. Right. It sure does. Amen. And sometimes the devil will withhold some of his harvest just to get you deeper in that when he comes, it'll come in in a mighty way. Yeah. The Bible teaches you and I that their harvest is greater than our planting, and that if we reap right here in the present, that it's because of our past seed sowing. Whatever your life is today is because of the choices that you and I have made and the harvest that we're reaping. Some of us have mental anguish because of the seeds we've sown years gone by. You see, there's all the time, and, I, and I, I preach it too, that God is a restorer. God is a healer. God is a helper. God is a forgiver. How many of you know that? And everywhere you go, there's churches that are trying to find, and there's nothing wrong with what they're doing. And don't misunderstand a, neg a thing that I'm saying here is negative. But some churches will search for the most violent and, and drug-abusing used to be outlaw that has turned Christian to get them to come to the church and tell them an hour long story about the history of their drugs and what drugs they used and how many rehabs they've been in and how many jails they've been in and how many relationships they've been in and, and they'll wear that out for an hour and then say well God saved me and he'll do the same for you now that's a good story and I understand that that God is a restorer God does save the, the outlaw God does save the in-law <laughs> that'd be alright to say that God does save those that abide by the law and those that don't they're all equal in the eyes of God but here's my theory on this that, and I'm glad that God uses them and I will too you hear what I'm saying? I'm, I'm not being judgmental. But here's the thing. Those people have a lifetime to live of, of the regret and the misery and the shame of, and, the, and the broken relationships of, that they've had that takes a mental and emotional toll of, on their lives the rest of their lives. What if we begin to get the anointing of God uh, that oh. when our children grow up, uh, they abstain from that oh. uh, instead of wanting to get delivered from it uh, and looking at us and saying, well, you done it, uh, so I can too, and when I get ready, I'll change too. Oh. Now, there's, there's that theory in there that we can get saved if our sin don't take us out. Oh. But we have no guarantee of tomorrow. We have no guarantee that we'll live to the point that we can recover. So we need to begin to preach to them of the abstinence of and the glory that awaits for them that when we understand that we don't have the baggage that some do. Now you may have a lot of baggage. You have no idea how many hundreds of pounds of baggage that I'm carrying today. We all have baggage. But if somebody could have helped us uh, so to seed in our life, uh, helped us to prevent ourselves from doing something uh, that we did, then how much wonderful would it be that we could run uh, and not be hindered and weary in this race? Matthew 6 and 21 said, and it's often used as finance, said, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And, and some folks have said, well, let me see your checkbook uh, and I'll see where your heart's at. <laughs> if there's not anything going to the church, then your heart's not in the church. But let's look at it in another way as well. <laughs> Wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What is it that you're passionate about? What is it that drives you on a daily basis? What is it that the seed that you're actually sowing is going to bring back into you? Are we treasuring 
love and joy and peace and gentleness and meekness and goodness and long suffering and temperance are we treasuring those things are we laying up for ourselves in heaven treasures that await when we see a man or woman of God come by are we sowing seed are we giving them a drink of water are we doing something good for them because the Bible says if we do we will reap or harvest in that prophet's Rewards. Man. You see, every time you feed the hungry, you're sowing seed to the kingdom. Yeah. You're going to get a reward when you get there. Every time that you do a good deed, you're sowing a seed into the kingdom. Every time you give of yourself away, you're sowing the seed into the kingdom. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Him. And where our treasure, where our joy, where our pleasure is, there is where our heart will be. Amen. You see, it don't take long to understand what drives a man or woman. You talk to them about 10 minutes or less, and you'll find out the uttermost passions of their heart. It's either work or money or cars or clothes or shopping, church or Jesus. Talking about my sickness. Talking about my bad day. Talking about my hee-haw mentality. You know what I'm talking about. You can talk to people just a few minutes and you can find out if they're an optimist or a pessimist. You can find out if they're full of faith or faithless. You can find out if they have any hope or are they are completely hopeless. You can find out if life's about others and Christ or if it's all about me. Just a few minutes will tell you the story. So here, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now the fruit that you're sowing has seed. And those seeds are being planted into the world that you and I live, into the hearts and the minds of those that are around us. And it's planting seeds of confidence, seeds of faith, seeds of hope, seeds of brotherhood and sisterhood, seeds of camaraderie, or it's sowing seed of division and hypocrisy and rebellion and the things that are contrary to the word and the will of God. It's every day that we live, we're sowing a seed to something. Now, I'd like to challenge you with this as I close in the next two or three hours. That'd be okay? One of my preacher friends said one time, I'll make every one of you happy today. And somebody mom said, hey, ain't no way you can do that. And he said, yeah, I'm going to make some of you happy when I get up. <laughs> rest of you will be happy when I sit down. <laughs> So, the seed time of the harvest, what is it that you're sowing? You may be sowing good seed. Wait on it. Keep sowing good seed. Your harvest is coming. But if what you have in your life today is not what you want, if your life is not what you want it to be, if you're not where you want to be with Christ, with your family, with your friends, or with your church, it's up to you and I to sow a seed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sow a seed into that. Be what you want others to be. Amen. Would that be all right? Amen. Well, if they just lift their hand down at that dried up church, I'd lift mine too. Well, bless God, everybody else saying the same thing. If you would lift your hand, it'd probably inspire somebody else. Amen. And he mentioned it, and I've had it to happen. They didn't even speak to me, and they looked me right in the eye. I said, well, did you speak to them when you looked them right in the eye? No. I was waiting on them. And I went over here to Brother Mark and I said, did you speak to her when you looked at her right now? No, I was waiting on her. <laughs> Bless God, they'd have both spoke if they'd quit being so stubborn. You hear what I'm telling you? The Bible said if you want yourself, want to have friends, to sit down and wait on them to come be friendly, didn't it? Uh -huh. No. <laughs> and it said if you want to have friends, you must first... You must first show yourself friendly. 
Amen. There might be a reason we're isolated and sitting on a patterless island. We might not be doing what we want to be doing. If you're not happy with your life right now, the choice and the time to change is right here and now. Now, every seed that you've sown will not stop, and every harvest that you've earned will not diminish overnight. I know it's kind of sad, but it's kind of happy if you've sown some good seed. So if you'd stand with me at Brother Larry's permission and they come to get us a song ready, well, I want to open this altar up to you. But I want to inspire you. There's two ways to live, and that's either fleshly or spiritually.